This is the BioCentury Show. Brought to you by the 24th BioEquity Europe, scheduled for May 2024 in San Sebastian, Spain. Join BioCentury EBD Group and Regional Host Committee Chair ECO's Capital for Biotech's premier CEO and investor conference in one of the culinary capitals of the world. Hello and welcome to the BioCentury Show. I am Simone Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief at BioCentury. I am joined today by Robert Plenge, Executive Vice President, Chief Research Officer and Head of Research at Bristol Myers Squibb. Those of you who know Dr. Plenge know him as a thought leader in the industry, in particular in discovery research, which he's written a lot about in his blog, PlengeGen. Um, he joined BMS as part of the acquisition of Celgene in November 2018, and prior to that was VP and he Head of Translational Medicine at Merck. So now BMS finds itself, like many of its pharma peers, facing a patent cliff and needing to bring assets in as well as grow them in-house. So we're going to get into some of those deals and the science behind them in this conversation, because that's really where, Robert, you sit. You've been the chief research officer in that role, as far as I can see, for almost a year now. Um, and the way it seems in our conversations is that in that role, you are really merging the strategic need to dis deploy, develop a, a discovery engine with your deep interest in the science. I think that's that's just, there's no hiding that, right? Now, I want to start with this. You have talked about a framework for increasing probability of success in translation. So I want to start with that and then dig into some of the specific ways that this framework plays out in recent decisions by BMS and in the way you think about it going forward. Talk about your framework. Great. Well, first of all, thank thank you very much uh, for for having me. It's a real honor. Um, so, as you say, you know, we've we've tried to put together a, a research framework uh, for how to think about uh, really delivering transformational medicines to patients. And I always like to say it, it always starts with the patient. As someone who used to practice clinical medicine, um, that's a really important part of how we approach uh, R and D at, at, at BMS. Um, and so the, the the framework really focuses on this inflection point of probability of success in clinical development. Um, and I think that's a, a, a key feature of having a productive uh, R&D engine. Um, and, you know, while there are a lot of different ways in which you could think about um, uh, probability of success and how to prove upon it, I, I think there are three key elements that we spend a lot of time on. Um, the first is this concept of picking the right targets um, based upon human insights, uh, and we refer to this as causal human biology. Um, the second is once, once targets have been identified uh, to find the right therapeutic modality that's matched to a molecular mechanism of action. And so we shorten that to be a matching modality uh, to mechanism because the other is quite a mouthful. Um, and then finally, how to bridge research and development. And so there's a very clear path to testing these therapeutic hypotheses in development so that you know if your medicine is working the way it's intended to work. So those are the three elements, causal human biology, matching modality and mechanism, path to clinical proof of concept. Well, let's start with spending a little bit of time on the first one, which is picking the right target. And I want to talk about this idea of causal biology. So if you were to explain causal biology, everybody would say, well, of course I want to do that. I mean, who wouldn't want to have the cause behind their, their medication, you know, their therapy or their, their approach? So maybe you can dig a little deeper and to, you know, shed some light on what are the approaches that distinguish that strategy and that really yield the best advances that differentiate, um, you know, one, one company or one program from another. So I think a lot of people say human biology, and then they'll say, well, gene expression data, that, that's human biology, or an observation uh, of, a, of a target that's you know expressed in different ways at the protein level or an RNA level. And that, that certainly is human biology, but it doesn't distinguish between a cause and a consequence. And so I think the causal piece is incredibly important um, because that's ultimately what you want to do to 
intervene on a disease process. And so the simplest way I like to think about this is causal human biology is having an understanding that perturbing a target will have a desired effect on human physiology that's relevant for drug research and development. And so I think a really good example of this is, is human genetics, and we can certainly talk more about that. Uh, but human genetics isn't the only way to establish uh, causal human biology. There are other examples in the case of autoimmune diseases, for example, um, uh, autoantibodies, or I think you know really uh, elegant ways to follow patients over time. So longitudinal profiling over time can also establish causal human biology. And then, and then finally, I think pharmacology is one of the simplest ways of establishing causal human biology. But but the challenge with pharmacology alone is often you don't have necessarily novel insights into novel targets. But that's a simple definition of causal human biology. So um, you went to pharmacology. That's my background. So I'm going to lean into that one. And I want you to help us map that idea onto the Karuna acquisition. So just for background, um, you know, uh, Bristol uh, spent $14 billion on acquiring Karuna with a very interesting um, therapy, car XT for schizophrenia. That um, therapeutic area has been let's call it difficult to say the least. Um, and I don't think actually many people had BMS on their bingo card for that deal because you didn't have that much in the clinic in neuroscience in that area. So can you map that molecule and mechanism onto the causal biology paradigm for us? Yeah, so that's actually a great example. So in the, in the 1990s, um, there was a study of a, of a medication, xenomaline, uh, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and the intention at the time was to improve cognition in patients with, with Alzheimer's disease. But ma many patients with Alzheimer's also have neuropsychiatric symptoms, agitation, and psychosis. And what was observed in these early studies was an improvement in the neuropsychiatric symptoms. Unfortunately, that came with side effects because these muscarinic M1 and M4 agonists acted not only inside of the brain in the central nervous system, but also in the periphery. So uh, while there was an improvement in neuropsychiatric symptoms, it came with adverse effects in, in the periphery. So you fast forward, you know, 20 years, and the causal human biology in this case was from the clinical trial was anomaline, but the modifications then that Karuna made to the molecule was to have a peripherally acting antagonist to prevent the side effects while allowing the brain, the, the, the medicine to get into to, to the brain to have the central acting effects, which could improve, improve um, uh, uh, psychiatric features. And the lead indication is in schizophrenia. And then a follow-on indication uh, will be in, in uh, Alzheimer's disease, psychosis, and agitation. And a PDUFA date for this medicine is uh, later on this year. Well, I'll come back to the Alzheimer's later. And I, I just want to emphasize that it's it's two molecules in there, right? It's a combination of two when you sort of say you've got the agonism here and then they, the, the um, peripheral uh, antagonism. And I think that that for me, uh, okay, apart from the fact that, you know, I told you this before, I'm a, a dopamine receptor person. So muscarinic receptors, they're close to my heart and there's a certain elegance in this. But I do think it's important because I think it's important to emphasize that causal biology isn't exclusively about the genetic approach that you talked about. This is not really a genetic medicine. In fact, this is classical pharmacology and just, you know, or classical molecular pharmacology, if you like, and sort of, you know, a ri rigorous sort of uh, approach to breaking down the biology in there. Let's just say for one minute um, in, in that arena, because I think that people, especially those who might be wanting to approach Bristol, my script for, uh, for a partnership or for something like that, will be very interested to know what your view is right now and your interest in neuroscience. And if that's an area that you're going to be going earlier into and expanding, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, it was probably seven or eight years ago now um, at, at Celgene at the time, um, we um, really came up with a pretty unique model uh, to think about uh, neurodegeneration and doing it not necessarily in-house, uh, but having really good 
expertise in-house, but then partnering uh, with small biotech companies and, and several of them uh, to build a, a pipeline. Um, fast forward to where we are today, and we now have uh, four molecules that are in clinical development that have emerged uh, from those programs um, and those partnerships, uh, but they're primarily focused on neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, uh, ALS, Parkinson's. Um, and those programs, and one of the, I think the most interesting one is, uh, is our anti-tau uh, program for, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but those are just now in phase one and in phase two clinical development. And so while we're really excited about the, those programs, we wanted to think about a way to really accelerate our re-entry into neuroscience. And I say re-entry because Bristol-Myers Squibb um, has a history of uh, being in, in neuropsychiatry uh, with Abilify as, a, as an example. Um, and so through CAR-XT and the Kroon acquisition, we now are able to accelerate our re-entry into neuroscience via schizophrenia, if the medicine is approved later on this year, but then to follow on to that with Alzheimer's disease, psychosis, and agitation. As, as another example uh, uh, for a patient population that could benefit from this medicine. So that's an area you expect to grow in and to add assets in. Yeah, exactly. And so if you think about like a broader model of, of neurodegeneration, and again, I'll focus on Alzheimer's just to pick one example, but you can think about uh, abnormal protein aggregation, whether it's amyloid or tau, um, that then leads to uh, uh, an inflammatory uh, response. And certainly human genetics points to both protein aggregation um, and, uh, and inflammation as being important in, in pathogenesis. But then with those protein uh, that proteins that aggregate with inflammation, you now have neuronal dysregulation uh, and also uh, neuronal death, and that leads to the symptoms of, of cognitive decline and then also the neuro neuropsychiatric features. So the, the medicines that I introduced at the beginning, anti tau, for example, that should be a disease modifying agent that actually prevents um, uh, uh, neuronal death. We have programs that are anti inflammatories as well. But CAR XT actually fits into this model because it's really some of the downstream effects of neuropsychiatric features like uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, education, and psychosis um, that could also benefit patients. And I think up to about half of, of patients with Alzheimer's will suffer from those consequences. And we'll go to another, you know, topic in a minute, but just to, you know, we call out, we actually wrote a, a piece, my colleague, Selena Coach, wrote, wrote a piece um, about, you know, the, a move that we don't really have to separate so much symptomatic relief in Alzheimer's from causality or from, you know, the long-term disease modifying. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how that how that shakes out. But I want to stay just, we're going to break in a minute, but I, I do want to stay one more one more question in the sort of picking the right target category. And, you know, we talk, uh, we in biotech, I mean, <laughs> talk a lot about first in class and best in class. Obviously, if you ask me, if you don't have one or the other, then it's really hard to articulate a benefit. But I can, can't tell you how many companies tell us they have a first in class as I'm like, well, do you really, you know? So maybe, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe you can tell us how you uh, look and define first in class and how you weigh it up. It, it's quite hard to know early in research if you're going to be first in class all the way along. So what are you really looking for in terms of comparing with the competitive landscape? Yeah. So I, I, we always try to start, and I know I said this at the beginning, but but really try to start with the unmet medical need and focusing on the patients. And I think that goes, I think, without without saying. Um, but, um, you know, if we go back to that research framework of causal human biology, matching modality to mechanism and path to clinical proof of concept, I think you can think about best in class and first in class based upon the, those first two. So is the target a completely novel and is the modality uh, novel against that target, that, that's clearly a, a first-in-class medication. Um, but I would also say that if you have a target, even if there's another way to modulate or perturb that target, well, you have an entirely new modality against that target, I would say that that's also a first-in-class medication, as long as it's a, a really a different way of, of, uh, of uh, perturbing a target. So you can think about a, an, an enzymatic inhibitor versus uh, something that degrades the, the target of interest. I, I would say that that would be a first in class as a protein degrader, uh, as an example. So I think that causal human biology, matching modality to mechanism framework can help you distinguish between 
uh, first in class versus best in class. And and one one other thing, I mean, for us to think about a, a best in class molecule, it has to be a really, really differentiated feature to make it a best in class. I think sometimes people will say, well, a little bit better selectivity or a little bit better potency, that's going to lead to a best in class molecule. And while, you know, I think that that is factually correct, like we really try to think of best in class as something that's truly differentiating, that's really going to make a difference in the lives of patients. All right. Well, that was that was very helpful. So we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll talk about modalities in the path to clinic. Right. For more than 20 years, BioEquity Europe has been where CEOs and investors gather to network, partner and debate critical issues facing the biotech industry. In 2024, BioEquity heads to San Sebastian, Spain in Basque Country, May 12th to 14th. Join BioCentury, EBD Group, and Regional Host Committee Chair ECOS Capital in one of the world's culinary capitals for a destination event designed for CEOs, investors, and decision makers across the global biopharma ecosystem. In 2023, 300 VCs and 330 biotech CEOs joined BioEquity in Dublin, Ireland. In San Sebastian, the program will feature more than 100 emerging biotechs that will present their story to investors and potential partners. Don't wait, last year's BioEquity conference sold out. Visit bioequityeurope.com for more information. We are back at the BioCentury show with Robert Plenge of BMS. Robert, let's talk about matching modality, right? The second part of your framework. Now, as I pointed out in the introduction, you came from Celgene. You've obviously been at the heart of CAR-T therapies. And now you're actually also involved in some of the solving, some of the issues that have arisen in that first generation. And I want to talk first about manufacturing strategies and rapid manufacturing. And tell me how this is relevant and why it's so important for this modality. Well, let me just start by uh, giving an example with, with CAR-T to kind of kind of just provide context. So, um, you know, we have um, a two approved products uh, in, in uh, lymphoma and multiple myeloma. Um, and, and when a patient comes in, um, you, you draw cells from, from a patient, you then take them into the laboratory, you engineer them to have the features to recognize the cancer cells and kill the cancer cells, and then you actually give them back. And so there's a period of time from when the patient is apheresis, the cells are taken from the patients, to when they're engineered and then given back to the patient. And the longer that duration, the the more chance there is for you know a patient not to benefit from from the treatment. So the first thing that we want to do with manufacturing is to really short, shorten uh, the the turnaround time. Um, the second thing that's really important about manufacturing is to make sure that the medicine that's actually given back to the patient is within specification. Um, and uh, sometimes if something begins to deviate while it's actually being cultured in the lab, you can get what's called these out of specs. And so another important part of, of manufacturing is to make sure that the medicine that's given back uh, remains within within spec. And then finally, I need to think about um, just the general safety and efficacy profile of, of the of the cells that are given back to the patient. And so those three parts of manufacturing, I think, are really important. The turnaround time, minimizing out of spec rates, and ensuring that the, the living cells that are giving back to the patient are going to have the right uh, efficacy and safety profile to benefit the patient. And again, those are examples in, in lymphoma and myeloma, but the same thing is true uh, for other indications like autoimmune diseases. We'll come to autoimmune in a moment, but you know, my understanding is that even though the premise, as you've written, is let's call it a safety one. I mean, you, you obviously want a, as short a time as possible that the patient is, you know, be, be, between the apheresis and, and receiving them. You want to have as healthy cells as possible. But on top of that, what you actually end up with is an efficacy advantage, so that you are. You know, tell us a little bit about you're actually turbocharging in a way the efficacy by going in with healthier cells to start with that then expand in vivo. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. And so there's a ratio of, of different types of cells, CD4, CD8, um, the maturity of those cells, whether they're naive cells, they're um, more mature cells and different um, uh, kind of ratios will actually have a difference on the ability of these 
engineer cells to go back into the body, find and kill uh, tumor cells. And I think we're really fortunate at BMS to have a lot of translational data that we can actually learn from so that when we go, out, go back to make the next generation uh, of, of, uh, of cell therapies, we can learn from the current generation to make sure we have you know, the optimal ratios of the, of the features that I just described. So let's talk a little bit about CAR T's and autoimmunity, which I know is like you know, very close to your heart. And I have to tell you, Robert, I think about this from two different ways. On the one hand, I think that, you know, and you've obviously been in that field for a very long time where they, they you know, the premise was in oncology. And so on the one hand, I think that it's, it's so obvious that how did it take this long? But yeah. I sometimes also look at it and go, my gosh, this is so risky because, you know, autoimmune is so different than oncology and the... Uh, the stakes are so different. So tell us about the path to that and how you see this as, whether you see this as a game changer or sort of an experiment. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll start with, I, I definitely think it's a game changer. Um, <laughs> but, you know, let, me, let me tell you why. Um, and again, I'll, I'll start from the perspective of the, of the patient. So uh, I used to practice clinical rheumatology, and I would see patients with severe refractory autoimmune diseases, including lupus. And the patient journey would inevitably go something like this, where a patient would come in and they'd say, I don't know what's going on. We'd establish a diagnosis. There'd be a sense of relief. Then the patient would ask, well, are there therapies involved that can help me you know, treat my symptoms? And I would say, yes, that there are. There was also a sense of relief. But inevitably, the conversation would lead to, well, now that I'm my symptoms are under control, like when do I stop this medicine? When do I come off this therapy? And the answer was never. These are medicines that treat symptoms but don't lead to functional cures of the disease. And because many of these patients are young, uh, often female, childbearing age. I mean, the, the imagine going on an immunosuppressive medicine for the rest of your life. I mean, it changes how you think about your entire life. So when we think about CAR-T in the setting of autoimmune diseases, this has the potential to totally change that paradigm, to lead to functional cures for patients so that going back to that patient, there may be a similar journey where you establish the diagnosis, you say that there are treatments, and then you have this third option where you say, and we believe we can achieve a functional cure. So I think just from that perspective, it really does have the potential to be game-changing. But as you say, there are complexities with the therapy as well, which we can talk about. So, you know, um, tell us a little bit then about that. We have a, a few more minutes, uh, uh, um, but tell us a little bit about those complexities because, you um, you know, I, I think one thing to point out is that very often by the time a patient is getting a CAR T therapy, you know, it is a matter of life or death. It's it's not, you know, and, and the risk paradigm is different. What you've just outlined for um for the autoimmune scenario or setting often isn't quite so dire, but maybe you'll you'll expand on that. And so I wonder whether it's sort of a maturation of the field that you have to be more confident that CAR, in the safety primarily of CAR T's. Talk, talk us through that. Well, I think the patients that are being treated today have failed just about every other, you know, every, every possible therapy. In, in autoimmunity. Not an autoimmunity, and yes, specifically right. in lupus. Um, and they often have uh, end organ damage, whether it's the heart, the kidneys, um, and, and the lungs, et cetera. So I, I think that um, these are very severe refractory uh, uh, patients. Um, but, but you know, I think that the challenge is that currently patients have to actually have chemotherapy lymphodepletion, followed by the infusion of, of a living cell, which sometimes can lead to um, an inflammatory reaction at the time of the infusion. Um, and then there's a period of time where they have to be followed and weaned off of um, the uh, other immunosuppressives, including including steroids. So it's a very involved process today. But I think the way I like to think about it is it tells us that functional cures are possible. Um, and now what we can do is, assuming that we continue to replicate the results that have been observed in some of the academic studies, right. If we can really have functional cures, now you begin to take away the lymphodepletion. You may lower the number of cells that are actually given back. Maybe there are other ways through not just autologous cell therapy, but allogeneic cell therapy, or there are other ways in which you could actually perturb the same axis. And so if we show that it's possible and then work to 
easier to administer or safer medications while still achieving the same desired result of a functional cure. That, I think, is the path over the next several years. Well, that's going to be very interesting to watch. One more question while we stay in this modality area, because I don't think that in today's uh, environment in biotech, we can have a conversation without discussing ADCs, antibody drug conjugates. So this area is exploding. These are expanding to merge modalities, adding targeted protein degraders as the payload, using immune modulators and more. Tell us how you're looking at this field and whether you actually think this modality sort of can become mainstream, a dominant um, way of thinking about the disease, even first line, or, you know, how, how are you looking at this, this sort of what people are calling Cambrian explosion? Yeah. Well, let, let me kind of provide a framework for how I think about um, uh, uh, cancer. So I think there are tumor intrinsic mechanisms, oncogenic drivers, cancer vulnerabilities, lineage-specific markers that will mark uh, tumor cells, and then there are tumor extrinsic mechanisms, immune cells, tumor microenvironment. And then I think importantly, it's the relationship between the two that ultimately I think drives um, a cancer, but also gives um, a, a foundation uh, for how to treat those cancers. Um, so in the case of ADCs, what we're really going after are those lineage-specific markers that basically says this is a cancer cell. And very often those are lineage-specific markers that are on the outside uh, of a cancer cell, but they can also be lineage-specific markers inside of a cancer cell. So once those are identified, then, and that's, by the way, that's the causal human biology. Right, of course. Most marker for a cancer cell. Then you say, okay, how do we actually attack that particular marker to kill that cancer cell? And there are a number of different ways in which you can actually do it. And the way that you're referring to with antibody drug conjugates or ADCs is to say, all right, let's find a molecule that can bind to that lineage-specific marker and somehow deliver a cytotoxic payload uh, to kill the cell. Uh, Topa isomerase 1 is, is a, one of the active cytotoxic payloads that's be, being given today. But as you say, there are other ways to deliver uh, cytotoxic payloads. And I think in an area that we're particularly excited about is to deliver molecules that can lead to targeted protein degradation that can kill cells in, in, a, in a different different and potentially a safer way uh, compared to some of the other cytotoxic payloads that are available today. But then, as you say, you can imagine expanding beyond just the ability to deliver cytotoxic payloads to potentially deliver in other types of payloads that will stimulate the immune response or potentially even induce neoantigens inside of a cell. So the ADC is simply a framework to deliver cargo to tumor cells to allow this tumor intrinsic and extrinsic mechanism um, to um, to play out to hopefully benefit uh, patients. But it, it does seem to me that with the sort of next generation of ADCs, which itself is a next generation of antibodies, yeah. what what's happening is that you're able to both tune greater efficacy and tune greater safety. So you sort of have a force multiplier to uh, improve that therapeutic window. Is that a fair way to look at this? Well, I, th I think it is. I mean, I think I'm, when you can get a level of specificity from the antibody that binds to the uh, antigen uh, that's specific to the to the tumor, that is the lineage-specific tumor marker, but you can add a level, I think, of specificity with whatever that payload is. So, For example, with the targeted protein degradation, you're adding right. another level of specificity, yeah. Right, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think there are a couple of different ways in which you can actually engineer these antibody drug conjugates to get better efficacy and potentially better safety. And then, as I also said, there are other kind of clever ways to actually engineer these ADCs to not just kill cells, but allow the immune system to work more effectively right. or potentially introduce neoantigens, or uh, there are a few other sort of tricks that we're thinking about also. Well, we're going to continue to, to watch this space. We have some interesting things coming out about that soon. Um, I do want to end by um, talking about this clear line of sight to clinical uh, proof of concept. Now, maybe you'll talk about what this means at a practical level, because I have to come back to you with what you've talked about earlier, which is, for example, Alzheimer's disease. You've got studies in schizophrenia. To me, these seem like not very clear lines of sight to very simple POC. Um, they're very complex. So talk, talk us through that and how it's going to unfold. 
Yeah, so uh, I think it's a great example. Um, so if you really believe in the the biology of the target, um, and say you know in the case of muscarinic receptors M1 M4 agonism, and you say that's we, the Corona we, molecule, just to remind yeah, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if you say, all right, th this is the causal human biology. Um, now we have a molecule that we know in our preclinical models agonizes the, those targets. Um, then what you want to do in terms of a path to clinical proof of concept is really showing. Uh, and this could be in the periphery in addition to kind of central acting mechanisms, the ability to bind to and engage the target and have a pharmacodynamic effect at the level that you think is sufficient to recapitulate the cause of human biology. And then showing that the molecule works in that way, now you can begin to layer on not just the biomarker uh, uh, pharmacodynamic effects, but what are the, the clinical uh, benefits as well? And now you can say, all right, in a short-term study, for example, seeing benefits on, on, um, on, on psychosis or, or, or agitation, then now you have basically an inflection point. You have a molecule that works exactly as you want it to work based upon your preclinical models. You're showing that it's behaving in humans in a way that you think is beneficial. And in this case, having a short-term clinical outcome study, now you're in a place where you can expand it to have a longer duration study. And that's when the studies get, of course, very expensive for registrational phase three studies. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, Robert. I know that we could talk more. I know that we will talk more. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to chatting again soon. Thanks. Brought to you by the 24th Bioequity Europe, scheduled for May 2024 in San Sebastian, Spain. Join BioCentury EBD Group and Regional Host Committee Chair ECO's Capital for Biotech's premier CEO and investor conference in one of the culinary capitals of the world.